do that. Okay, I'd like to welcome you all and we are going to uh, share this screen with you. Can everybody see that? Yes? Okay, so uh, welcome, a warm welcome to you all. My name is Paul Snooks. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Worcester Environmental Group. It's uh, really good to have you all here. We've had about a hundred people say they were signing up for today, so um, it should be quite a crowd. Um, what I'd like you to do is in the chat, uh, if you would be kind enough to um, tell us uh, just uh, where you're from and just in what literally one sentence why, why you're here. So that would be quite interesting to have that scrolling down uh, whilst we're having a, a chat. So uh, would people care to do that uh, while we're now I've, I've lost. Uh, where's my chat? I've lost it. I, Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, if people would like to just put down South Devon, look, there's one working for a wildlife friendly parish. I don't understand that, a wildlife friendly parish. There you go, lots of interesting. Good, I hope everyone can read that. Ah, so Sharon, is Sharon giving the talk today? I'm Sharon. Talking, uh, Paul asked me to say a few words about Coat and Loves Pollinators. Brilliant. And Stockholm That's great. Pollinators. Thank yeah. you. Lovely. So there's some interesting um, <clears throat> information from everybody. That, and you will have an opportunity later on um, after the Q&A if you want to chat to someone privately that might be of interest in, in those. That would be absolutely wonderful. Um, okay, um, so we've got four speakers. Uh, I'm going to speak first uh, for the Worcester Environmental Group. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, On The Verge Sterling um, will be speaking to us about their experience. And then On The Verge uh, Cambridge. Have we got Ben in here now? Ben, Ben's joining us shortly, Paul. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, and then Coton loves pollinators uh, last. We'll be speaking between five to 10 minutes, uh, each of us. Uh, what we would invite you to do is to uh, write down your questions during uh, the presentations and uh, uh, Alison Morgan, who's labeled as my name as well for some reason, uh, will be uh, recording. She's a co-founder of Worcester Environmental Group. Uh, with me. Um, she will be uh, making a note of your questions and we'll be asking those to the panelists, the four panelists uh, at the end. Um, okay, so uh, let me just, uh, before we start, I want to, let me come out of that. And I want to, um, can can uh, can you see this screen? Could you just give me a thumb thumbs up about the volunteer opportunities? Yep. Okay. Great. So um, as you can see there, um, there are many uh, different ways that people can contribute. Um, one of them is um, through making donations, which many of you have done, and um, I'll be giving you a link. Um, to there right now, if you want to. Um, hang on, send chat to everyone in the meeting. Here we are. Um, so there's a link to PayPal if any of you uh, want to uh, make a donation. We're going to share that between uh, the four groups um, and um, uh, minus, minus any expenses. So, um, and we'll be using those to further our work with verges and, and, and uh, meadows. I would appreciate, appreciate that. Sorry, who's talking there? I don't know. That is, maybe I could. Yeah. Uh, right, so um, 
th these are some of the things that we ask our volunteers to do, get outdoors and tackle physical jobs like taking care of a tra traditional uh, meadow or orchard, digging a pond, knocking in posts. Um, so if any of you live near any uh, Cambridge or Stirling or Worcester, Worcester, you might want to do that. We're always looking for people to help us applying for grants. I'm sure all of these are applicable to all four groups. Um, do public relations and marketing. Uh, offer expert advice. I'll talk about that uh, later. There might be some of you here that are experts um, in the, these areas. You might be environmentalists, professional ecologists. And, uh, we're always looking for people to give us advice. We're certainly in Worcester. We're uh, enthusiastic amateurs that need expert advice to make sure that we're being pointed in the right direction. We're always looking for help uh, on our website. Um, at the moment, uh, Alison, the co-founder there, whose name is Paul Snooks, and this um, uh, looks after the finances and the steering committee members and to be a membership uh, secretary. So there's the kinds of things that we're always looking for people to, to help us with. And as I say, I've put that PayPal link, um, if any of you care uh, to donate, you don't need uh, to have PayPal, you can do it uh, with, with a debit or credit card. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk to you first. Um, as we said, we're going to have me first and then on the verge Sterling um, and then on, on the verge Cambridge. And then finally, Coden loves pollinators and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. And please write your questions as we give our presentation. So uh, I'll start uh, with my presentation and I'll explain that, that picture you can see there. Um, so, um, let me just tell you a little bit about the Worcester Environmental Group. We started off as the Villages Environmental Group, uh, which is a modern suburb right on the edge of the M5 in Worcester. Uh, uh, it's a modern estate, uh, won all sorts of fun, uh, awards for, um, it's got a huge amount of green spaces and 30 or 40 different ponds, uh, triple SI, um, walking and cycling routes, uh, traditional orchards, um, uh, extensive grassland, uh, ancient woodland. Right, looking out my window now, uh, there's a an ancient woodland right opposite me here that was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. So um, they 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 put this estate and kept a lot of the nature, um, and so we set up this group, uh, Alison and I, um, to. Uh, take care to help uh, be involved in taking care uh, of these beautiful green spaces, enhancing them and so forth. Um, so uh, uh, we've got three goals um, and, and they are to uh, protect and enhance the biodiversity. Initially, we started off as uh, in Warnden villages in Worcester, but uh, we had people coming to us throughout uh, the city and even beyond the city. And we've now expanded into Worcester Environmental Group and are doing projects around the whole of the, of the city. So we're protecting and enhancing the biodiversity of the whole of uh, Worcester, working closely with other organizations and particularly with the Worcester City Council. Um, we are trying to educate uh, the residents of, of uh, Worcester about the biodiversity in our area. Um, and I'll touch on that, some plans that we have, and I'd be very interested to know if any uh, people have um, worked, with, uh, how you, you have reached out and communicated with uh, your, your residents. And we're also trying to improve the well-being of residents by creating more opportunities to connect with our local environment. Um, and let me just give you a little bit about the history. Um, I early retired uh, several years ago and uh, started doing lots of environmental work uh, as a volunteer uh, locally with the city council and the friends of Warnden villages started to make lots of connections. But I noticed the verges were like billiard tables and wanted to do something about that. Um, there's just no life on them at all. But I was told fairly clearly at that point that they, there might be riots and 
um, houses burnt down if we if they didn't look like billiard tables. I'm slightly exaggerating. I am prone to that, um, but um, uh, you know there the, the, the wasn't an opportunity at that point. Um, I continued to um, get to know uh, local councillors, council officers, uh, the parish council uh, people, and um, uh, last year decided to um, uh, try again with um, uh, trying to get a verge uh, going. So we set up the, the village's environmental group and started taking care of uh, some extensive, uh, uh, an area that was turning back into scrub um, called Aconbury Orchard. And we managed to persuade uh, the, uh, to lobby the parish council and our city councillors successfully to have a pilot project on Doug, uh, a place called Dugdale Drive. Uh, and let me just show you, um, let me just come here and show you this. Um, so, uh, Dugdale Drive has got, uh, this is our website and um, we, we did a survey, you saw the picture of people, uh, uh, of Alison and, and one of our vo expert volunteers doing a survey and there are 30 different, uh, 30 plus different species in this pilot project uh, of, of a verge uh, without us planting anything. It, it had been sitting there patiently waiting for for 25 years to, um, uh, to, to grow. And you can see there uh, all these different plants um, uh, just blossoming beautifully. And what we've done here with our website, uh, let me just look at this one, for example, chickweed, click on that. And uh, hopefully uh, with many people watching it. Yes, there you go. It goes to the Wildlife Trust and uh, gives you information, more information about that particular, particular flower. And then you can just go back to the web page. One of the things that we're um, seriously considering, I'm meeting one of our volunteers tomorrow, uh, is to, uh, we, want, we want to be able to give people, uh, residents, this information on site. So we're considering uh, we would like to have um, information boards, but they're several hundred pounds each. And uh, uh, we don't have several hundred pounds for lots of different uh, um, uh, boards, uh, information boards. So um, we're thinking of putting posts uh, about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters with a QR code on them that will say, please scan me. You scan it and it will take you to uh, this uh, web page uh, here giving you information about about that so uh, that's one of the things that uh, we're considering doing if any of you have done that we'd be very interested to see uh, you put in information about that in chat um, uh, we would like the information boards but uh, we, we really can't uh, afford them we um, we have made a, uh, I touched on it earlier, we've made a big effort to, to uh, contact experts, professional ecologists. We have been extremely fortunate that we managed to um, uh, engage with the Natural England, uh, Herefordshire and Worcestershire um, meadow specialist who came onto our steering group and gave us lots of advice um, and she has now been promoted to the national. Um, she's the head of uh, certainly England and Wales for the, for the uh, as a meadow specialist of uh, uh, native meadows. And so we've got several people who uh, steer us uh, and give us advice as and when, uh, as and when we need it. Um, so uh, I, if I, what have I missed out? Uh, let me just look at my notes quickly. Um, I think I'd just like to just give you in conclusion. Um, oh, I wanted to say this as well. We, w since we've had this pilot uh, project, we have managed to um, uh, persuade the city and parish council uh, for us to start having a lot more 
one of the things that we got. Um, could you just give me a thumbs up, please, Alison? Can you can you see the the you can see the slideshow again? No. Can you see it? Yes. Yep, you can. Okay. So uh, one of the uh, machines. I, um, uh, I, I do a lot of networking and, and talking to people in the background uh, and um, I spoke to a couple of key councillors uh, probably about two years ago about uh, getting cut and collect machines which are a very important part of the regime uh, if you want to create meadows and uh, native wildflower meadows you really should cut and collect you shouldn't be leaving the cuttings uh, the arisings uh, because they add fertility you want to reduce the fertility. So we managed to persuade um, a, a couple of uh, counts, key councillors to lobby and, and uh, they bought this Amazon um, uh, cut and collect machine and there's a smaller one for, 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 for verges. Uh, so they ha they've got two of them now, which uh, we're really pleased about. Um, so uh, let me just give in conclusion, uh, what um, what we've done. We're applying for charitable status in the near future. That I believe will help us with uh, grants. Be interested to know whether Sterling and Cambridge, uh, uh, what kind of, how you're constituted. Um, so in conclusion, I would say it can take years um, in our experience. We've now seemed to have opened the floodgates. We met with our MP recently. Let me see if I can uh, this is um, scarifying uh, this last week, and we managed to get green hay from a, a, a very old traditional meadow um, uh, where we spread the hay full of seeds um, uh, in, in one of our orchards. And uh, there's the green hay being spread full of all sorts of wonderful native wildflower seeds. And finally, um, this is uh, me schmoozing with our uh, member of parliament um, who um, we, we, we had a debate uh, on you know, he, um, whether um, having his in, is not desperately green uh, would be the opinion of some people is not a, a great environmentalist. Um, I think it's really important to engage with, with people of, uh, of all persuasions. So uh, we got in the newspaper recently with that. Um, so building a network is really important. Um, and finally getting a, a, a good group of volunteers around you and there. We had uh, yesterday, we had about 10, 12 people, I think it was, wasn't it, Alison? Um, yeah, um, uh, working uh, in, in an orchard, uh, preparing uh, the ground for, for um, a wildflower meadow there. So uh, that's about me uh, done. Um, so um, I've been getting lots of private questions. Uh, um, uh, have they been coming to you, those private questions, Alison, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So the, sorry, the, the, Alison's been sending me some uh, hints here. Um, the, uh, the, cut, the cut and collect machine uh, is owned by the city council. Um, we managed to lobby and 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 find out uh, who who was in positions of of power and influence in the city council and and uh, had quite some success doing that um so that's how we did it so that's me done uh, uh, uh lee over to you um <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's fantastic to have so many people joining us tonight. And a huge thank you to Paul and Alison for organizing the event. I think Zoom has given us all a wonderful opportunity to connect on a much wider level and share our experience and our knowledge and help work together collectively to make our local environments work better for nature, because many of them need to. So with that in mind, I just want to give you a, a, a bit of a story around how On the Verge in Sterling evolved, um, the challenges and pitfalls that we've faced and where we are now, because this year has been quite pivotal for us. We've had a, a change of approach in some respects. So it started about 10 years ago. I was in my kitchen making sandwiches, listening to the radio, and I heard Dave Goulston talking, and he's one of our foremost bumblebee experts in the country. 
And he, at that point, he was based in Stirling. And he said a phrase that resonated with me. He said, um, he was talking about declining um, population, pollinator populations, and he said that some species of bumblebee had already gone extinct and others were on the verge of extinction. And I thought, oh, on the verge, that's a, that's a great name for a bee project. Somebody should really do that. Um, by the end of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about it and the whole thing had sort of fully emerged, planned in my head. So I... Um, took it to a friend who was already working for an environmental organization, told her what I thought. She said, yeah, let's give it a go. We'll get a group together, see what happens. And that's what we did. Um, we, what we wanted to do, Dave Gorson has said a very interesting thing. He'd said that um, pollinators were adapting their behavior to because the wider environment wasn't very friendly for them any longer out in the countryside. So they, it, research was showing that they were coming into urban environments. And I thought, well, if they're clever enough to adapt their behavior so quickly, then we should be clever enough to adapt ours to help them. So why not make our urban environments work better for pollinators? So we wanted to get as many wildflowers in and around Stirling as possible, not just on the verges, but anywhere. And we wanted a good geographic spread. So we targeted schools and community councils initially to get that geographic spread. I was worried that people wouldn't be very interested and wouldn't get it going. But after a few phone calls to a few people, it became very clear that a lot of people were interested. And then I was worried that we wouldn't be able to manage that interest. So I actually spent the first year just worrying about everything. But um, in the first year, which was 2011, we sewed up with seven schools, uh, five community councils, a local business, a church, a care home and a local rugby club. And I look back at that now and think we must have been mad. And the areas were, would vary from a couple of square meters to a hundred square meters. So they varied quite a lot in size. Um, we just made it up as we went along. So every hurdle we came across, we just worked out how to get over it. The first issue was money. We didn't constitute ourselves initially. I still don't know why, it seemed like a big thing to do. Actually, it's not, it's really easy. So I don't know why we hesitated. Instead, we asked 10 local businesses to give us some money and we raised a thousand pounds, which was fantastic. So we had the money to buy the seed. We then had to work out what we were going to sow. We knew we wanted to sow up a native mix just to fit in with all the regulations and legislative requirements. We've got a great company in Scotland called Scotia Seeds. Some of you may have heard of Scotia Seeds, I don't know. Um, they had gave us great advice about the seed mix and we decided to go for 100% wildflowers, all native, because we get a better display and it'd be more nectar rich, so no grasses. The grasses kind of turn up anyway. We wanted a small component of annuals to cover the first growing season so we'd have something to look at, but the majority of it were, was uh, perennial species. So we worked out the seed mix. They called it the on the verge mix, so we're very happy about that. The next hurdle was how to prepare the sites. Um, we were only 10 of us in the group. We didn't have the muscle, the time or the manpower to do that, nor did the community groups we were dealing with. So some really clever person pointed me in the direction of our criminal justice service. Now, every town I think has this service. It might be called something different in your area. It might be um, community payback teams. They now call our service the unpaid volunteers, which makes me laugh because I'm an unpaid volunteer. And many of you will be unpaid volunteers. And actually, these guys aren't even volunteering. They're just doing it to avoid um, prison time. So, But anyway, they prepared our sites. They did a great job. So that solved that problem. The next piece of the jigsaw puzzle was working with our local authority. We wanted Stirling Council to be involved. We had to ask them for permission because they owned most of the land we were sewing up on. It was schools, it was parks, it was those sort of areas, not actually verges, really, ironically. Um, I knew they wouldn't give us money. We're just in the middle of a recession. I only wanted them to sew up a few areas of their own in a high profile place just to support the project. So track down my our biodiversity officer and i would say that's a really key thing to do to get in touch with your biodiversity officer if you want to get involved with your local authority he was great he set up a meeting with the powers that be i did my pitch 
They agreed in the first year to sew up 25 different sites, some on verges, throughout Stirling, a total of 1,440 square metres of wildflowers. So that was more than I even dreamt of asking for. So that was great. They duly did that. We had a press launch. Fantastic. We then had the driest, coldest spring I can remember. Nothing happened. No flowers. Everybody's saying, where are the flowers? Nothing. And I was, the anxiety levels went through the roof. I thought, if we don't get the flowers, the project's going to fail in the first year. It's going to be dreadful. Finally, the summer arrived in July, and the flowers came with it, and we were in business. Everybody was delighted. Um, now, the, the relationship with the, the local council has kind of evolved from that quite organically. They sew up big areas, wildflower meadows, and we sew up smaller areas working with community groups. We do community events, we give out free seed. We even jointly organized um, an Inspiring Meadows conference for other local authorities in 2015, which was fantastic. Now, my first word of warning is at this point, if you are going to work with your local authority in a similar way, Try to future-proof whatever you arrange with them. Because what happened sort of the last couple of years is that personal changes took place within the council. The biodiversity officer moved sideways. The head of grass cutting, who was my main contact, left. And everything that I'd arranged and set up and all the relationship building kind of fell through the cracks. And I've had to start all over again. So I'd say, I don't know how you do it. If anybody does know how you do that, please tell me, because I'm still in the process of reworking those relationships, and it's quite hard work. But if you can future-proof all the arrangements you make with the local authority in terms of making it their policy, if they can put it into policy documents, then that would be great. And don't make the mistake that I made. Um, so that takes us to where we are now. Today we've sewn up um, over 10,000 square meters of wildflowers. We've worked with over 100 community groups. And we don't just throw the seed at them. We help support the process from the beginning to the end. We help get permission to sew up. We help them do the sewing. We give them the seed. We come back after time after time to check how it's doing, to see if we need to do anything to keep it flowering year after year. So it's a we get good succession on the sites. Um, and we've got lots of new ideas this year. We want to do beds for bees, where wildflowers are maybe not thought suitable. So that would be uh, beds of nectar-rich perennial plants. We want to do that. We want to do planters for pollinators. You'll see I like a bit of alliteration. And we're working on um, advice sheets to give out to community groups to help them uh, get away from bedding plants and put in much more nectar-rich planting into their hanging baskets, their planters, etc. But I think the main change this year has come as a result of the pandemic and lockdown. Um, during that time, and I'm sure I'm not the only person here tonight who's experienced the same thing, I took a lot of comfort in nature and I did a lot of walking with my dog around the local environment in Stirling. And this year I saw wildflowers that I've never seen before. They were beautiful. I saw banks of cowslips, violets, swathes of cuckoo flowers. Just, it was fantastic because the grass cutting teams were not in action. And I had a sort of eureka moment where I suddenly realized that what was the point of groups like On The Verge going out there and sowing up homogenous seed mixes whilst at the same time the council are mowing out that natural floral diversity that's there. Um, so I'd already been in discussion with the council, lobbying them gently to adopt cut and collect, which, which Paul's already mentioned, and which I think Ben is going to talk more, in more detail about later. And um, they sort of, it's a, it, cut and collect is a much more um, naturalistic, uh, ecological way of managing grassland, not just verges, but all your grassland, that's your parks, cemeteries, all the connecting strips of grass throughout every town. We've got so much in Stirling, so much. Um, and it's a really brilliant way to do it. It saves money, you get automatic pollinator corridors. It's fantastic. So I, I hadn't been getting very far with the council, so I decided to use my newfound free time to ramp up the campaign. Um, got a, a, a petition together, which got loads of signatures. So they now have to debate that at the next council meeting. 
um, spoke to my MP who lobbied the elected members of the council to kind of get their fingers out on this a bit, spoke to the MSP who uh, wrote to the CEO of the council asking them to get on board, I lobbied all the other elected members, got the press on board, um, spoke to officers within the council, organised for experts to speak to the officers, to tell them how it all worked, basically did everything I could to get this on the agenda. And the upshot now is that it's going to be discussed at the next meeting and there's a business case being drawn up to see if we can get our first cut and collect machine because I have cut and collect machine envy and you've got two in Worcester, it's just not fair. We have to get one in Stirling, so if it kills me, that's what's gonna happen. So I would say to you, um, if you want to make a difference in your local environment, to get that land managed for ecology, for biodiversity, for pollinators, I think two things that you could do which would have the biggest impact would be lobby like crazy your local council to get them to adopt, cut and collect, and to abandon the use of pesticides. Slightly separate issue, and I think hopefully we're going to have a, meet, a big um, seminar about that in the future, about pesticides, but if you want to lobby your local authority, we are very happy to help, certainly on the verge. We've got lots of information we can give you, we can introduce you to the experts who can help. There's a brilliant chap called Phil Sterling from Butterfly Conservation Org. Um, if you want to set up a group, it's, I think it's more powerful to do it through a group rather than, I don't think I'd have got so far if I'd been doing it as Liviagi. I think if I'd done it as, by doing it as On The Verge, I think it had more heft. And if you wanted to set up an On The Verge, We'd be thrilled about that, so please do contact us, um, contact us personally, me or Ben, and, and let us know how we can help you. Because um, collectively, if all of us do this in every little part of the UK, we can really get the UK buzzing and make a really big difference. So, you know, if you want to do something, get in touch, we'll help you. Um, there were a couple of other things I want to talk about around the challenges around the project, around the aesthetic and other issues but that might came, come up in the Q&A so I think I've said everything I want to say for now um, and hope more will come out in Q&As so hand you back to Paul thank you for listening thank you very much uh, Lee that was really inspiring um, I have um, square meter envy with the amount that you're doing there, it's fantastic. So we, we have the cut and collect machines, but uh, we'll try and catch you up quite soon, hopefully. Um, so um, I'd like now to welcome uh, Ben um, of uh, On The Verge Cambridge, uh, a sister or brother organization of, um, of uh, On The Verge Sterling. So uh, Ben, where are you? I'm here, Paul. Can you hear me? Yep, great, gotcha. Great, okay. Welcome. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Alison. Thanks for organising this uh, event. Um, it's thrilling, really, uh, to be uh, attending and presenting. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, my name is Ben, Ben Gregg, and I live in Cambridge, and I'm a member of On The Verge Cambridge, uh, which is, as you might guess, a uh, satellite or sister um, uh, organisation uh, inspired uh, on the Sterling on the verge model um, our aim um, i'm just going to quote from our the aims we wrote down when we first, first started the the group on the verge cambridge promotes the growing of nectar rich wildflowers around the city our aim is to provide an abundance of food sources for pollinating insects which are in catastrophic decline um, how it came about uh, yeah you've already heard the name dave goulson i went to a, a talk by dave goulson a few years ago uh, at Cambridge University, where he was talking about the problems bees face and insects generally. And he mentioned a few organizations that were doing something positive about their situation. And one was on the verge in Sterling, uh, which I filed away in my, in my mind. And it, it, for some reason or other, it popped up again last year. Uh, I think I was looking around really for, for, a, for a, a way to um, um, help uh, and a way to help locally, um, something practical to do. And it popped back into my mind and not having a, a better way of going around it i sent a message around to uh, the whatsapp group that me uh, and our friends at uh, our allotment have 
and uh, several of them came back straight away. I think Joe's here in the in the meeting, possibly Alice as well. Um, and uh, a week or two later, we sat down around the table and um, came up with a came up with a plan. I got in touch with Lee in Sterling to see if we could use the name and um, model, and we we went from there. That was last. That was July 2019 when we set that up, and we 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 did constitute ourselves at that point. Um, very simply, we started a bank account, a basic website, and a Twitter account. Um, we are only still only five people uh, at the core of it, busy with jobs and families. But we are, um, yeah, we're passionate about wildlife and our city. Um, looking, we looked at the Sterling model and thought, well, yes, then our our intention is the same. Well, we want to identify areas of land suitable for pollinator-friendly planting. We want to find out who owns it, plant it up appropriately, and establish a management plan which looks after it to ensure its longevity. Um, uh, so that broadly what we thought what we thought we'd do um, and how has it worked so far well we our first point of contact was um, getting in touch with the biodiversity officer at Cambridge City Council who is extremely helpful uh, he's a very helpful guy cool guy he uh, he immediately asked if we would help reseed the existing city park wildflower meadows. Now, Cambridge has quite a lot of city parks and um, tucked away in the corner of uh, about half a dozen or more of them uh, are small wildflower meadows which had originally been planted with a fair, an annual mix. Um, and the idea was to move them over to more of a perennial mix. Um, and in October last year, so that that's that's what we did. We did the reseeding in seven of our city's parks and in each park meadow uh, a sign was put up that the council provided which uh, explained what had been done and it had the council logo and it had our logo and I think our website as well, uh, URL address. The seeds we used came from a local supplier in East Anglia, Emma's Gate Seeds. Um, the meadows themselves, as I say, are relatively small compared to the surrounding parks I think the biggest is about the biggest of the meadows is about 700 meters squared and the total amount is 2000 meters squared so for an initial project i mean we were very proud but really um the council gave us a huge um uh help there by giving us that project to do so we could get our teeth into something very, very quickly um when these meadows bloomed this spring is it brought a lot of public positive publicity i think as you can imagine uh, helped a lot by the renewed respect for green space uh, during the in the pandemic and from this publicity came a support for the wildflower meadows uh, themselves uh, and b ideas for new city park meadows where there hadn't been any previously uh, c other biodiversity improvement schemes so um We've had several just locally organized residence groups come to us saying we want to beautify and improve the biodiversity in our local area. Maybe it's a patch of grass, maybe it's actually a verge running alongside a path. Um, what can we do? So we've we've stepped in there with a, with advice. Where it's a city park meadow, then we've taken that idea to the council. Uh, I have a spreadsheet which um, uh, I update regularly and I send to the biodiversity officer and the schemes that arose spring and summer this this year um, were, have all been accepted by the city council as feasible uh, though I suspect that COVID-19 budget cuts might push some of them into next year um, uh, although the seed itself is relatively inexpensive and we have been collecting seeds from several of the meadows this summer anyway just just to save money uh, there's a little bit more uh, money required to prepare the ground which the council were using their operations team for but we hope we're hopeful that that can still happen and if not we may have to resort to um, uh, small armies of volunteers and possibly uh, the community payback system which um, 
Lee uh, mentioned they use a lot in in Scotland. Uh, we haven't used them at all yet, uh, but we may do. We may do. Um, beyond this, we also actually in the winter while we were planning, really, I suppose, more, more than doing anything else, we had a chat with the council, and it, we independently both thought it was a great idea if we produced what we call planting pallets. So uh, each would be an A4 sheet of paper with four or five plants suitable for a particular zone, maybe a shady zone or a, a wet zone or a roundabout um, or somewhere that gets heavy footfall. And we, we, that was given to our two horticulturalists on the team, Alice and Sylvia, and they're still working on some of those uh, now. We've got some of them. And we submitted one to, uh, to the city for their uh, new roundabout that's just come into operation. So uh, I'm hoping they put that into effect with the suggestions we gave them. So with that, we're hoping to influence municipal planting uh, to make sure it's pollinator friendly uh, more than it might otherwise be. Um, I think there are problems we, we maybe encountered in our first year. Um, we're a small team, as I described, and we, we, we're fitting this in in our spare time. So that presents problems of uh, logistics. Uh, it's, it's also quite easy to get bogged down with, with small projects. So we have had one or two people come to, come to us for a very small meadows, which might take a, quite a lot of time. And if there, there's one in particular next to a play park, which really actually got trampled by the children very quickly. Um, but there are ways around that and we just have to work with maybe signage and maybe a little fence, that kind of thing. Um, so it made us also think about how do we improve biodiversity on a larger scale more quickly. Um, so wider aims. I think with a view to that, I attended a conference organized by the Suffolk Naturalists Society uh, this March, just before lockdown, about the week before lockdown um, in, yeah, in Suffolk, uh, called On the Verge of Success. Um, and there were, um, there were several presentations there that I, that I were impressed by. Uh, the, the most impressive were Kate Petty's from Plant Life and Phil Sterling's, uh, who's now at Butterfly Conservation, which Lee's mentioned already. Uh, about then they were about roadside verge management they were very compelling uh, but with very simple ideas um, as has already been said but I'm going to repeat it uh, it was to do with cutting less cutting at the right times and using cut and collect and this combined message um, was very clear if you get this right if you get this right um, you will both boost biodiversity and you will save money, um, which is, uh, I'll come around to why that's, I think we all know why that's important, but I'll come to it in a bit more detail in a minute. Yeah, so, and I've, uh, I don't know if we can see that, this is the document that Kate Petty produced last year, Managing Grassland Road Verges, page 13 is the page I point people to. I can send around a link to the PDF to um, people. Ben, could, uh, two more minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, I'll, and then, yep, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yep. So quickly, uh, cut less. Cutting too often prevents the flowers from setting seed, reducing biodiversity. Cut at the right time. Ideally, two cuts: one in February, March; one in September, October. Have a look at the guidelines um, there. Cut and collect, removing the arisings, um, as Paula said, depriving the verge of nutrients, reducing soil fertility. High soil fertility suits vigorous grasses, which can then outcompete flowers. Low soil fertility is the key to encouraging wildflowers. It's very important to note, and this is one of Phil Sterling's big points, that the more you cut and collect, the soil fertility gets lower and lower, the less you have to cut the following year. So your savings actually accumulate. And this is the way to persuade those in the council whose heart may be in the right place, but they assume that biodiversity comes at a financial cost over time it actually saves money. And we, uh, we can introduce you to Phil Sterling. He's very keen to give talks to um, councils around the UK. Uh, he gave a 
a great talk to City, Cambridge City Council um, a few weeks back, which uh, the biodiversity officer used to take to the operations team and the head of the budget in order to persuade them to move towards cut and collect. And we have to follow up with that and find out where we are with that too. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to say quickly- You could wind up contact. please. Yep. We made contact with other like-minded organizations like Sharon who's coming up in a minute and obviously uh, Sterling and now Worcester. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Ben. That was uh, equally as inspiring as, as, as Lee's uh, information. That was really, really uh, helpful and it's certainly given um, us in Worcester a lot, lot of uh, ideas for future progress. Now I'd like to welcome uh, Sharon Cairns uh, with us who uh, is going to talk about a, uh, I believe a rural um, verge um, project um, and Coton loves pollinators. Over to you Sharon. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me and a special, a special thank you to Ben for actually introducing me to your group. Um, I thought I would start today by um, talking about the first project, Pollinator Project, which I was involved in co-founding actually in Sweden, called Stockholm Loves Pollinators, because I think it draws together some of the issues about the um, importance of urban areas specifically um, for supporting pollinators, which um, might not seem obvious at first, but um, they are in fact um, especially according to research uh, done by Bristol um, and uh, Jane Memot called the Urban Pollinator pra uh, Project extremely beneficial for pollinators. So um, uh, Stockholm Loves Pollinators was a joined up community action project and where I think it's quite interesting is it actually ended up being a partnership between grassroots community groups like the church and international organizations and local groups, business and municipal um, government. Uh, the initial attention was to focus it uh, in, on in the importance of urban areas in supporting pollinators and to ensure that Stockholm um, had developed a biodiversity which actually included specific me measures to support pollinating insects. Um, this can get lost um, and actually we will see that they have special needs. Um, it started uh, with myself being based at the British Embassy and the Vicar of the English Church and a sustainability consultant and beekeeper. Um, I would say there's a, a quite a big advantage in teaming up with uh, a sustainability consultancy if you can. Um, they bring with them uh, not only credibility with a wide range of contacts across all sectors, um, probably um, business, government as well. Um, and also in this case, um, there was some money as they worked with local uh, beekeepers to ensure that they received uh, a little bit of money from companies looking to demonstrate their corporate social responsibility. And they could do so by renting a beehive for um, a minimal amount. So this helped us when we first started going. Um, and the way they then worked is we drew, drew up a charter, which if you look at um, cities, uh, B Cities USA, um, they have a, a very well developed mo model in the States, but we took some of the, I'm one for recycling good ideas. We took a couple of their points of their, they have a charter on B City USA. Uh, so we took seven simple points, which would be um, you, how we would encourage people to engage with supporting pollinators. Um, and then, um, um, so I'll so leave areas to grow wild, don't use pesticides, don't cut the grass too often or too short, leave dead wood, create areas for ground nesting insects, put up insect hotels. So actually very simple. And what, what you realize is that actually this is something that everyone can do at your place of home and work. And cities and peri-urban areas offer really good opportunities for that. Um, we had in, um, initially started by just something simple, wanting a beehive. And then um, I think as we all agree, if you have bees, you tend to look for the forage and food that they might need to survive. You often have you know, 20 to 50,000 of them. Um, and that captures the imagination um, and working with a church in the city, you have a large congregation and a wide diversity of expertise and enthusiasm and knowledge and contacts, which you can draw on. 
the parks within cities, and I think this is very, very interesting, can have a very strategic role. In our case, uh, we were based within the Royal National City Park, which is actually 27 square kilometers and embraces beaches, uh, lots of land, woods, um, and also within that area, you had um, a wide range of stakeholders um, from museums, restaurants, universities, garden centers, housing, housing corporations and allotments. So we were able to um, take the next step, which was um, to see, can we uh, get the city to become actually an official pollinator zone? And we invited representatives from all of these different stakeholder groups to come to the embassy to uh, really hear what their views would be and actually to sound out um, what was most useful was sound out any objections or fears or problems that they would see um, with implementing some of our very simple um, uh, advice on how they could support pollinators in their way and depend according to their means. Um, and being with, in, in the case, this case, it was a, a diplomatic community and this worked well as uh, the problem facing biodiversity and the decline of pollinators is um, an international one, it crosses borders and uh, we encourage um, both the city and all of our stakeholders who we worked with, businesses and community groups to focus activities around a single day, uh, which was UN International Biodiversity Day. This became an excellent hook because you tap into a much wider um, uh, movement supporting biodiversity um, worldwide and you can rally resources and people and for uh, businesses that are stretched, community groups that are stretched or councils, this helps them to focus their activity and year on year you can look to incrementally increase and improve activities that um, you are doing to support biodiversity. Um, and so how do we actually engage and get a project going? Well, the, initially we held simply walks and talks um, uh, for, on the role of cities in supporting um, pollinators. And we contacted, because uh, in Sweden they, didn't, uh, they, they don't have a national pollinator pol policy unlike um, the UK. So we contacted the organizers of Get Bristol Buzzing and asked them to share their pollinator material. And as well, they have their own um, city pollinator strategy. So um, this, this proved to be extremely useful and saved us time and energy. Uh, so it meant that we were able to uh, at, you know, say that this came from Bristol Buzzing, but translate it all. And it can also be used for any project. It, um, they have a lot of resources that are uh, very useful for um, how you can plant allotments, how you can mow verges and, and so on. Um, using our contacts with the sustainability uh, group, we commissioned a study actually of land management practices currently being used by the, by the managers of the municipal park and city park and its impact on pollinators. And we um, invited 30 of the city land managers to a workshop on um, how they can support pollinators and, and actually just very basically what is the role of um, pollinators um, and what are the ecosystem services they provide and this was really um, enlightening although many people worked in this area you might think they might be they were actually um, very grateful and found this extremely useful and practical workshop we did this um, both physically and online inviting contributions from people researchers at Bristol University, for example, and equivalent organizations. Uh, we also then um, worked with the city's Department of Environment, um, much like Lee and Sterling, and worked on their green space planting program. They did, in fact, have quite a significant budget, and mostly it was outsourced to other people lands uh, and contractors to deliver public planting in beds in um, along city stations and so on and we asked them to uh, uh, specify that at least one third of any city planting would be pollinator friendly um, this this was um, this was adopted um, and in addition to that we took 
quite a strategic look at the function of green spaces in the city um, and talked about the value of connectivity corridors. So we know um, from some of the research that there, while there can be lots of disparate habitat that's beneficial for pollinators, including verges and so on, one of the most beneficial things we can do is connect up these uh, areas to make transport and movement corridors. Um, Sh um, Sharon, sorry, yeah. could uh, one or two more minutes, please? Yep. Thank so, you. so that was a strategic. Um, so we identified certain streets and areas where we could uh, work on verges and connect um, city parks, which are incubator zones, out to surrounding areas. Um, which brings me to, so that was the, the experience I brought with me to Coton, where I've now returned, where I started a small project. The project is very simply to work with um, residents and volunteers to enhance our own village and surrounding areas for pollinators. And it really um, has as its base the idea that really everyone can get involved, community groups, and there are specific um, within villages um, you have schools and churches and um, individual gardeners and landowners and they all have a vital role in supporting pollinators and if you give them the right advice um, and we did this through uh, setting up a website where we shared um, information on, on uh, with lots of links on to RHS and plant life as already suggested we gave a talk to a local garden centre and um, what proved to be very useful was um, inviting uh, professional garden designers and horticulturalists and botanists within the village to work with us, uh, create a steering group um, and visualize actually what can be done in these areas and give some of their expertise. Uh, um, sorry, Sharon, would you better wrap up now? Yep. Please? And yes, then you. if you have a garden centre, that's very useful for getting planting. So our local garden centre was able to support. Uh, so there are, within your village, you'll find, um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. And with that, with, with very little cost, we were able to raise, just raise awareness and then work with the school, uh, the school, the garden centre and um, garden society to help people understand what they can do and to demonstrate within our village by creating um, pollinator planting in different areas of the village. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Sharon. That, that inspiring to know that things are happening um, in other parts of the world as well and, and that we're, we're sharing and learning information um, with countries. Um, I just want to thank uh, Lee and Ben again, uh, along with Sharon, for uh, your motivating and inspiring presentations. It's just really exciting that uh, that this information can, I think, I'm guessing everyone's from the UK. Is there anybody from Ireland, I wonder? Um, I don't know. Um, well, thank you very much, all of you. I'm now going to hand over to um, Alison, uh, who's mysteriously got my name uh, there. She doesn't look like me at all. You'd look splendid with a beard and very little hair. Thank you. Um, Alison, but um, so uh, over to you to handle the, the, the questions, please. Okay, so while everybody's been talking, I've been furiously scribbling questions that people have been leaving in the chat, and I've tried to group them all together into um, uh, themes. So if I miss your question, please feel free to put your hand up and tell me. Um, we'll start with cut and collect. Um, so there's been all sorts of questions around the cut and collect machine that we have. Paul will correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's an Amazon cut and collect. Yes, uh, and it's we have an Amazon. Well, we, um, they're owned by the city council. Um, Paul lobbied the city council, and we actually had the machines before we had the meadows, or indeed the verges. And we have actually had councillors who agreed to have these say to us now, two or three years later, we don't actually know what these things do. Um, but anyway, the point is, we've got them. The council own them, the council use them. We don't own them. We don't use them. Um, our insurance doesn't cover us to drive them, so we're reliant on the council using them. Um, um, I'll put the I'll put the link in in chat uh, right now. Um, lovely, thank for you for the for the Amazon machine. I should say that the chat will be saved from this, so um, we'll be able to collate all the information from it and we'll put it together in a document. 
which will be available on Facebook and our website. And obviously we'll share it to Stirling and Cambridge and to Coton as well. Um, sorry, uh, Alison, I noticed quite a few questions about the arisings. Yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah, great. I'm, I've started at the top. Um, so there was one question which was about the negative effects of cut and collect and the possible damage that um, cutting and collecting does to invertebrates. Um, I'm not an expert on this by any stretch. Um, I haven't personally come across anything that talks specifically about the negative effects of cutting and collecting. Um, in terms of seeds, there is obviously an issue in that you want to cut and collect after the seeds have dropped. The problem obviously is that if you wait until September, October, it might suddenly get very, very wet. Our verge is okay, our meadows are not. Um, one meadow in particular gets very, very wet. And if we waited and took a chance on the weather, there's quite a good chance that we wouldn't actually be able to get onto the land. Um, if anybody else wants to come in with anything on that, they're more than welcome. There's um, something there, we're Claire very is... new to this. This is our, the, one of the questions was how long have we been using it? The first cut was done last September. We have had cuts since. We missed one because of lockdown. There has been one done recently. So there's probably been two, three cuts. So we are not experts on this, but this is the kind of information that we can find out. Or if anybody wishes to chip in, then do feel free. Someone's chipped in there just now, Claire. There's currently no scientific literature on how cut and collect machines impact inverts. Okay. I mean, on, on the verge. I would imagine that if you take something that's cutting things fairly short, that there is a chance that anything that's alive in there is going to get mangled. So I guess it's one of these pros and cons. I mean, maybe there needs to be more research done. Um, um, that's certainly something that I would like to look into. So, you know, it's not something that's actually occurred to me. Can I, can I just give a thought? Of Prior to the Second World War, um, the, the, these meadows would have been cut and, and collected, of, I'm guessing uh, uh, traditionally without uh, machinery, but in terms of, of uh, the, the, the habitat for the invertebrates being uh, removed, that would have been the case. Uh, and and uh, the, the invertebrates have evolved with that, with that regime. I don't know whether Lee, Ben or Sharon have got any thoughts on that. Ben? Yeah, I think there's no perfect answer to, to any of this. And, and as Alison mentioned, there's, there, is some, there could be winners and losers in it. Um, I think uh, mosaic cutting, so you, you, you kind of cut some of it, you leave other parts of it, you know, perhaps that minimizes the damage and allows some invertebrates to, 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 to hop, hop out of the way into other longer grass. I mean, maybe that's the solution. But yeah, I think you're right. We need a lot more research on that. But if, if the verges aren't managed, certainly if they're left uncut, they just revert to scrub and you won't get the pollinator aspect of it coming through uh, so well. So it is a balance that we need to find somehow. Okay, ben. Somebody has, I think it was Matt, has said, um, cut on, oh, there you go, uh, cut on rotation. So that's another option. So I suppose the problem for us then is that we're, if it was us doing it, that would be easy because we would know this week we'll do this bit, next week we'll do that bit. Because we're having to work with the council, we talk to a council officer who's fantastic. The council officer then doesn't work in the same department as operations, so he has to go to somebody there. And they then tell their guys what to do, and their guys don't always do what they're told to do. So actually, uh, you know, there's ben, a communication problem. Ben, ben has mentioned uh, to us previously about uh, the operational people having um, uh, some kind of handheld device that tells them yeah. what, when, and what to do. That's right, Paul. Yeah. So, um, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the name of that uh, system yet because. Um, uh, my contacts on holiday but uh, anyway yeah our city council um, do have now a system whereby the operatives who are actually carrying out the work each ha have a handheld device as you say telling them what requires doing exactly where with a sort of geolocation so you can there are systems out there that allow specific instructions about specific verges to be in place for exactly when that operative goes in and does the work which has been a massive problem before I know 
uh, and probably is anywhere that you don't have that system, I'm sure, still. Um, but there is certainly technology out there, and I'll get, as soon as I get the information, I'll feed it to everybody, and we can post it out there to, to everybody out there. Um, I agree with what Matt said, I think, in the chat that, yeah, and what Lee said as well, Mosaic would be great, and that, if that's possible with, with the technology I just mentioned, that, okay. that's fine. Yeah, there's no magic silver bullet that will help everything all at once, but um, so we're, there are problems as well, I suppose, but overall, I hope it's a, it's a win, what we're doing at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the other main subjects was what do you do with the arisings? Um, some of our fields are cut by a local farmer and he takes the arisings for hay and that's his payment for doing it. Uh, last year we spent a lot of time clearing those fields of ragwort. We pulled out thousands and thousands of ragwort plants. Um, the ragwort's not an issue if you're just leaving it, but if you want it for hay, ragwort can be poisonous to cattle and to horses and farmers obviously don't want it in there. Um, so if you do have ragwort and you want to make hay, you're going to have to remove the ragwort. It's fairly easy, it comes up, it's quite shallow rooted, you just get hold of the base and yank it, but obviously there can be quite a lot of it. Um, the other bits, Paul, correct me again if I'm wrong. I believe we, it's all put at the side of the field, isn't it? Yes, it's put in the, in the side or corner of the field, which can be a useful habitat for yeah. uh, um, uh, um, amphibians and other um, species to hibernate over the winter. Yeah, somebody so said, I mean, obviously you can compost small amounts, but once the amounts get bigger, it could be harder. Somebody else has said, well, they make hay bales and they sell them again, making sure that there's no ragwort in there. Um, and there was a comment made that, well, after a couple of years, this becomes less of an issue because the sward isn't so high because there isn't the fertility and therefore there isn't as much to be dealing with. Um, I think we'll probably just stick with putting ours around the edge of the field. I mean, we're, we're very lucky in that the, the area that we cover is quite large. People are always surprised when we take them up to our fields. We sort of keep going around the corner and there's more. So we aren't stuck with one narrow bit of hedgerow where everything's got to be dumped there every year we can vary where we put it um somebody else has talked about anaerobic digesters i think in worcestershire there was talk of having one i think gloucestershire has one doesn't it uh, lincoln lincolnshire um lincolnshire have got one. is uh, uh, and we're hoping to get uh, um a couple of speakers from there in the near future where they're they're cutting and collecting from their verges and then taking it to anaerobic digesters to put into the um, in, into the gas um, um, main. So um, we've spoken to, I can't remember the name of the Lincolnshire County officer. Can you remember who, who she was? Oh, um, we've spoken to so many people. I want to yeah, say Helen. Um, Helen somebody. And she, she's going to be giving us a talk, which could be really interesting about how are they working with uh, Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust um, use their risings, put them in an anaerobic digesters and create, create um, income. Uh, from Ooh, I've got ben. Like, yep. Yeah, I've got a bit of information on, on that because I know in Cambridgeshire, uh, I think some time ago, they looked at the uh, issue of cut and collect and dismissed it because of no, there was no local anaerobic digestive digestion plants um, and therefore it wasn't, an, in their view, an economic, it wasn't economically viable. Uh, but Phil Sterling's point he made to us very clearly was that that's a bit of a red herring. So don't be put off by that because, uh, as you say, actually stacking the arisings discreetly, um, even from verges, never mind natural meadows, but from verges, is possible. And that's what they've been doing, I believe, in Dorset now for quite a few years. It, it, you know, it beds down. It, it, um, it's a great habitat in its own right. You have One has to educate some people in, with the idea that, it might look quote unquote untidy um, here and there, but um, but it's but it's a, it's a it's a, sim a small price to play to pay. Yeah. Um, it, it, can I just say it is the, probably the biggest challenge 
certainly here in Stirling, with all the discussions I've had, what to do with the Arisings is the thing that worries the, the local authority the most. They're not desperately keen on the idea of using it as mulch. There's no AD plant and there's no local composting. So that's the biggest battle we've got here. I think that's even more of a challenge than finding the capital cost to buy the machinery, which isn't great. It's about 20 to 30,000 pounds. So yeah, that is a big challenge. What to do with the Arisings? Um, we're still working on that here. Okay. Um, there's people have been putting all sorts of links into the chat. Um, I shan't go through all of those now because there's a lot of them. But just to say that, again, those will all be collated. So don't feel that you've put it in there and we've ignored it. We haven't. It'll all be there at the end. Um, so moving on, uh, there was a question about sourcing seeds locally. We've been advised that it's the best thing to do. Um, we've been quite fortunate in literally just this week, um, we've got a local countryside centre and there's a piece of woodland and they have meadows as well. And we were able to take three tractor loads of green hay and spread those on our, you know, the areas that we're managing. Um, I don't know what you've been able to do in Stirling. Well, we just this year, we've started collecting local wildflower seed, which has just become my major new hobby. It is fantastic. It's amazing when you start doing it, how much seed you can get from a whole range of species. So we've just got into that now and we're going to manage some wildflower meadows a little less aggressively. So we're going to go in at the end of the autumn. We've got two big community sites. We're going to get volunteers to go in. Um, Cut, we're going to cut it back, scarify it, sow in some yellow rattle, which is parasitical to grass, which helps weaken the grass, and then cast in the wildflower seed that we've been collecting um, throughout Stirling. And that way we've got completely local species, a much greater diversity of wildflower species, and it's saving loads of money. Um, yellow rattle is very expensive to buy and very easy to collect. So I would say it, and it's something that I would encourage everybody to, to, to do. Well, not everybody, because then there'd be no wildflower seeds left for anybody. But it is something that you can do, and it's a cheap way of enriching local wildflower meadows. So there's, there's a picture I've just shared again of, of us spreading the green hay. Uh, for, it was less than a mile away, the, this uh, ancient meadow, wildflower meadow. So we're hoping that will produce positive results uh, in the future. Yeah, so I, th I think yeah. the message is that if you can do local, that's fantastic. If you can't, it's not a disaster. Um, so, um, ah, now then. So, question for all of us. Could we be specific in terms of the total areas that we have transitioned or plan to transition? And how were those areas chosen? Um, our verge, I think, is 20 by 40. No, not it can't be 20 by 40 metres. I've got that wrong. About 20 by 50, I think. 20 by 50 metres. Our um, pilot verge, our first verge. Pilot verge. We were very fortunate in that we have a professional ecologist who was able to go with us and say, when you're looking at verges, look for these species. So it was things like self-heal, clover, yarrow. So we were able to go around with our heads down. And I'm sure that there were people driving past wondering what on earth we were doing. Um, but we were able to go around various areas and say, well, we'd like to put a med you know, little wildflower verge there. And then we'd look and go, well, there's not a lot going on here. So we were able to find a patch where we could identify those species. We could see that they were there. It's just that because they were being mown so regularly, they were never getting the chance to show themselves. So our verge hasn't been seeded we just let ours do its own thing. And we've had over 30 species identified within it this year. Um, can, can I, uh, um, we've been advised by one of our uh, uh, professional ecologists who says he's seen this done all over the country um, where there is predominantly grass on the verges to scarify it. Uh, and then with the wildflower seeds, um, um, uh, uh, sow the wildflower seeds and then um, get into the regime of, uh, of cut and collect from, uh, uh, have uh, Lee or Ben or Sharon got any experience of that regime of scarifying and, and, and seeding where a verge is predominantly grass? Because that's what we're being advised to do 
Well, I just want to say we're, we, um, parish councils and various people do get nervous with the growing virgins and so on. So we've actually adopted a pollinator friendly bulb planting to change the mindset away from um, daffodils and tulips. So actually within the village, we are planting um, with, uh, with a garden designer do, doing that and then saving um, the roadside versus for areas that we're working with the county and city council. But that is another option for villages in another way and you, it also involves volunteers and community days but um you, you do get you do have to address this uh, the cutting cutting regime whether it's on a local parish council level or your level as well what sort of areas are you covering then sharon we are doing all our high street all the verges along all the roadside verges on the main axis throughout the whole village okay so what and sort of distance that, um, well, they vary for, it's probably about a kilometre or so in total. And then you've got the school grounds and the churchyard and the village green and the recreation ground. And then in terms of verges, the pilot project is really doing this linking um, from the city parks out to the villages. Cambridge happens to be surrounded by villages. But okay. yeah. Lovely. Sh uh, Lee, sorry, what sort of area do you cover? I mean, you've got so many different sites, you must cover, yeah, you must have cover, quite a We cover three counties now, um, Stirling predominantly, Anclack Manager, and now a bit in Falkirk. And I mean, a lot of our sites aren't actually, strictly speaking, verges. We do have some, but verges do have attendant problems with, you know, if you've got community groups working on them, there's safe health and safety issues, there's sight line issues. So a lot of our sites are kind of in, in schools and parks and around about and some big meadows and that now I am much more of the thinking that we, we should manage big areas of grass as meadows incrementally year on year introducing yellow rattles scarifying other seeds going in and just do it more gently I think that's a much better way to manage um, grasslands but a lot of our sites aren't actually verges in spite of our name. Mm. Ben what sort of area do you cover? Yeah well we uh... We're primarily focusing on Cambridge City, so it's a sizable city and getting bigger all the time. Um, but we're also trying to influence the county, which of course is, is huge. Um, but that way you can, um, you know, hopefully we can influence a much, much wider area and they're responsible for so many road verges, um, so many more than the city. But we, um, we ourselves, we're not working on road verges ourselves. Um, we, you know, we were only working within um, green spaces in the city uh, uh, so far. Um, uh, so we, we don't have health and safety issues with, with that. And we're relying on, on council and contractor operatives, really, who have their own systems um, for verges. Uh, I was approached just last week, though, by um, somebody in a village near, near Cambridge, in Shelford, um, to, because they have they have a very very um, grassy uh, meadow, and they're looking to get. They said well, so. We, we decided that they would scarify the ground there, and so yellow rattle, which a local resident has volunteered uh, lots of seed for, so he has some from his allotment. So that's a sort of perfect combination, really, because um, I know it is. It's not that cheap in itself, um, and they will have to scarify it unless they want to take the turf off. But it it, um, it would be better really, I think, if they scarify it do that probably um so but i have less experience than uh than yourselves in worcester and lee of course because we're just a year on so we're, we're finding out things too <laughs> oh we're learning as well i mean uh, paul what sort of area do our meadows cover I should say we've got meadows across three sites um we have one that's by um, a very ancient church it's 12th century we have one that's in essence behind the local supermarket and then we have our series of fields that are near the local hospital but what sort of area are we covering it's quite um, large i'm i'm not entirely i mean we're looking at hectares that's for sure um, mm. uh, um several uh, we've got dawn merriman here who's one of our um parish councillors i don't know dawn whether you you know the uh, acreage that we've got i'm asking you to unmute there um can you no. Oh, yes. No. Yeah. No, I don't know what the acreage is, Paul. Okay. Thanks, Dawn. Areas. Yeah, but uh, quite extensive areas. We're looking at uh, hundreds of meters in 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 um, uh, width and hundreds of meters in 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 depth. Uh, the, 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 certainly the largest one. So we've got three quite large meadows, 
and where we live in Warnham Village is where Dawn is a parish councillor responsible for the environment. Um, we've got a, a lot of grass verges, um, more than anywhere else in, the, in Worcester City, I'd say, wouldn't you, Dawn? Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, um, so moving on again. So the next questions are around planting. So. Um, do you reseed or do you leave? Um, what about the management regime? And linked into that, um, what about changing public perception? In Worcester, there's lots of roundabouts that have some really lovely colourful displays on them. Um, and they are wildflowers. The problem is that they're not native wildflowers. So they're very visually appealing and they're very good for um, nectar and they're very good for pollinators to come in during the season but they tend to be annuals and uh, our insects won't lay their eggs on them. So they don't support the full life cycle. So I don't know how Lee and Ben and Sharon feel about them. We tend to take the view that they are, they're not bad of themselves. You know, they fulfill a function, but they're not the whole solution. Uh, we found that talking directly to people has been the best way. Paul is very good at stopping people who are walking past and saying, you know, do you look at this verge off? Do you come here? Um, do you like what you're seeing? And then explaining what it is that they're looking at and explaining the difference between those showy annuals and the less showy native species. And when you talk to people, there's usually like a light bulb goes on and they go, oh, right, we get it. And we haven't actually had anybody come back to us and say, well, you know, we'd still rather have the bling. Um, there's a place for the bling, in my personal opinion. Um, but obviously our verges themselves are wholly native. Um, as I explained, we didn't have to reseed ours, but there's obviously time and a place for reseeding. But you can go to companies like Emma's Gate, British Flora, um, what was the one you mentioned? There was it Scotia Seeds in Scotland, yeah. Um, <laughs> And if you talk to them about where you are, and particularly if they're local seed companies, British Flora are local to Worcester. Um, if you tell them where the land is, they will know what soil you're on and they will have seed mixes that are specific to those soils and they will advise you. And, you know, for instance, we have talked to them about seed mixes and areas where there's a lot of grass and high fertility at the moment. You know, we could ask to have extra 10 percent yellow rattle to try and keep those grasses down. So there are all sorts of things that you can do. Um, in terms of management, I think again, that's, it, it comes down to communication again, talking to the council, finding a council officer that you can engage with and getting them to understand what it is that you want in terms of a management routine and the benefits to them. They make a cost saving because they're not having to cut as often. So, I mean, again, Lee, I, Ben, I, I don't know if these are, or even Sharon, if, if these are things that you've come across. I mean, could, I just, could I just say something quick? The, without exception, when I, uh, I've explained the difference between the, what I call the bling on the roundabouts, which is visually very appealing, and, and the native stuff, and, you know, that you get more butterflies, you get more uh, pollinators, you get more bats, you get more birds. Without exception, people go, ding, light bulb moment. Uh, and um, uh, we seem to convert virtually everyone we speak to about the, the, these positive benefits. Who doesn't want more butterflies? Who doesn't want more pollinators and bees and bats and birds? And that's been our experience. I'd be interested to know with Lee, Sharon and Ben. Yeah. Well, I'm quite jealous of hearing that, actually, because it's the single biggest challenge that I have with the project is public perception. So everybody loves the annuals in the first year, that they're just there to cover that first year. And they're relatively neat and tidy for wildflowers. They're very colourful and there's a big wow factor. And no matter how many times I explain that the perennials will have a very different look, and we've got 20 perennial species in the, in the mix. Often with community councils, um, not with schools, but with community councils, there's always a slight, oh... Oh, and or they might say it hasn't worked because they're not recognising those species as valuable. So we had some research done for us by Stirling University, looking into the benefits of the annuals versus the perennials. And a very talented student came up with some really good data. She had the paper published. We got a lot of publicity from it. And her findings were that the, 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 the 
the perennials, the native perennials, are twice as effective as the annuals for lots of reasons. They're more nutritious because they've got more nectar and there's a greater range of flower shapes to suit a greater range of pollinators. So we use that data, but it is an ongoing issue persuading people to get away from the neat and the tidy, the bedding and the colour, to accept the look of things that are less manicured. So it is just about keeping on going and working on the um, changing that cultural perception but it is it's it's not to be underestimated I, we are finding a big challenge um the uh we'd be interested in in seeing that uh, uh, uh research document at some point if you could put a uh, send us a link or, or put it you, in the chat I'll so that send you a link um and and you can share it with people and there's some really good data in that um and in terms of management i'll just say so we went back to look at a site this summer that hasn't had any management. It was sewn up in 2011 and it's just slipped through the net. It's in a school, it's there's very wild ground, it's had no management whatsoever and I was fully expecting it to have just vanished. And I have to tell you, it looked spectacular. It looked like a site that had really found how it wanted to be. There was a great range of species, fantastic mosaic of, of, of habitat and, and size of plants. And that was with absolutely no management. Normally we'd want at least one cut and collect at the end of the season. It hasn't had any. So even a site that isn't managed will find its way if it's left to get on with it. Um, um, we've got, we've got uh, about five minutes uh, before we wrap things up, so uh, it's approaching nine o'clock and people okay. maybe want to have their horlicks and go to bed. <laughs> um, right, an easy one. Um, somebody asked about ownership of verges. If you approach your councils, you will find out whether it's city owned or, council, uh, or county council owned. I don't know what the equivalent is in Scotland. It's just all a uh, council. Council, yeah. Um, that's that one. Uh, somebody's asked about educating residents, especially those who aren't online. Um, again, I think we we do a lot of talking to people. We're out and about quite a lot, especially Paul. Um, I don't live. Paul lives directly where our verges and meadows are. I live a little bit further away, so Paul's out and about there a lot more, and he he does a lot of one on one with people. Um, we, um, we, we have we are going talks. to be. I mean, obviously, COVID's put paid to that one. But we uh, we are going to be. Um, hope we're hoping to get a grant to put up these QR codes, um, where people scan and then they see uh, a web page giving them information about what they're, what they're looking at. Does anyone have been to, either in the chat or one of our speakers here? Does anyone have any experience of of giving um, uh, information? Uh, we can't afford the boards they're yeah. hundreds of pounds each yes i mean if in the village we found that there were um, graphic designers and botanists and members of uh, natural history societies very willing to contribute so we got free our own id cards so we've made trails for people that can be accessed online and um, at the moment they're they're laminated and going out but we're also exploring the qr idea and um, local fundraising um, uh, south cams water has a biodiversity fund um, so that it might be possible to access some local funds and zero carbon funds, but definitely um, getting over the hurdle of people worrying about this untidy, messy look is, is, a, is a super important challenge. Can't underestimate that. Um, but working, you know, in your sort of con congregations and gardens, in our, in our, that, that seems to have made, made the difference. And actually allotment societies and schools where you just get a large mix of people. That, that's made a really shifted the mindset in our village in any case. Fantastic. Uh, 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 Alison, do you think maybe make this the last one or? Um, I'll make this the last one. I am aware that I've missed out two or three, but don't worry, we've got them and they will get answered um, later. Uh, so the next big thing was insurance. Uh, because we work on city council land, we're covered under the city council's insurance policy. And also our road verge is on a, it's a 30 mile an hour road and also it's quite wide. There's a pavement and then there's the verge itself is quite wide. So we're not, you know, we're, we're not on a 60 mile an hour road working next door to roaring traffic that's ignoring the speed limits. Um, we are in the process of obtaining our own insurance. 
which will cover us for that, I think, our public Yes, it will. I think the only thing we're not covered for is working with chainsaws for some reason. Um, so I think if you're working on council land, it may well be that your council has a policy that covers community groups. If you're not working on council land, you'll need to sort out your own public liability insurance. Who is it that we've gone through, Paul? Um, I can't remember now. We did try to talk to Zurich because we could get a 10% discount, but it's very hard to get a 10% discount on something that they won't talk to you about. So um, we went elsewhere in the end. Yep. Okay. I think we'll, we'll wrap things up. I'm just stunned by the information and questions in, in, in the chat. Um, this is the first time we've recorded this. Does it record the, the chat as well? We have to save the chat, but it's fine. We had the chat we'll be able last to time, but we can save that. It. And we'll be putting that on our website. I'll just type that for you now. Um, what I'll do is, is I'll collate everything and make sure that there's a coherent answer to questions that have been asked. Um, so I'm just putting our website there, thewedge.org.uk, um, in the chat. There'll be things on our Facebook group as well, which is Worcester Environmental Group. And obviously we'll be sharing yeah. everything with Sharon and Lee and Ben. So, so there'll look be up, all sorts of outlets to access all this information. Yeah. Worcester Environmental Group, uh, we'll have it there as, as well for you um, uh, um, on Facebook. Um, thank you, uh, all of you, uh, all of the participants and, um, and all the amazing information you've given us and, and, and really insightful questions. Thank you very much, Lee uh, uh, and um, Ben with the uh, On the Verge and, and Sharon with Coton. It sounds exciting and I can't wait to come and visit you people to see all the wonderful things you're doing. And I'm quite serious about that. I really do want to come and see. Um, can I just again uh, give you the uh, uh, link which I've now lost? Wait one second if any of you would care uh, to uh, donate. Um, it would be very helpful for us to, um, with the projects that, that we're doing, um, let me just put that now in the chat for you. Uh, just going to do that now. And if any of you want to volunteer any of your skills or time, uh, please contact any of the groups. Uh, let me just... Uh, this link just a moment no that's not working Mary help I've got my young adult daughter here um, who helps me with any technical issues why is this not working it's at the beginning of the chat yeah we put it right at the beginning as well so I think um, it's the one that says does this work and the answer is yes it does here we go. I think, I think I've got it here. Here we go. That should work, hopefully, says he. No, sorry, that isn't the right one. Mary, help. <laughs> sorry. Where are you going to send it? I'm just... All right, I'm just finishing. I'll be, I think it's two minutes. Yeah, put it. You're going to put it in the Zoom chat. My daughter's going to put it in the Zoom chat for you right now. What would I do without um, that? My 25 year old digital native. Are you uh, nearly there, Mary? Okay, there you go. There's the link. Uh, hopefully, this will work. Yes, that works. That, there's that link. That, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we really appreciate it. We, we do have lots more talks uh, lined up. Uh, we've got one with Bridget Strawbridge. Um, I don't know if any of you remember her. It's hard to be green or difficult to be green, a, a television series. Green. What was it, sorry? I think it's It's Hard to be Green. It's Hard to be Green. Bridget Strawbridge has written this most fabulous book, which, uh, where is it, Mary? Where's my book? Um, um, Dancing with Bees, beautiful book, which I'm going to be interviewing her about. Uh, so please go to our website and look up our talks. And then we're going to have one with the Lincolnshire uh, um, uh, Verge project, 
um, in the near future as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Enjoy your Horlicks. <laughs> Good night. Thanks, Paul. Thank Thanks, you. Alison. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. I can stop recording now. You can stop recording. We need to just make sure that we've saved the chat.